So now for the main event. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Leticia Brengman. She's a PhD. Uh, Dr. Brengman is an associate professor at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And her presentation, as you probably all know, is entitled How Ancient Iron Rich Rocks Tell the Story of Past Oceans. And I know she will be happy to take questions. Uh, with that, Dr. Brengman. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for the invitation to be here. I'm, I'm really excited um, to share some of the work that our lab has been doing um, and hear from you all what your interests are and uh, what discussion points you might be interested in talking about. Um, so in a second here, you should see my slideshow come up. All right, hopefully do you all see, oops, number one, some slides and then hopefully in a second, a laser pointer here. All right, thanks. <laughs> so um, thank you again for the introduction. So uh, really what I wanna kind of present is just uh, this idea of, of what minerals are recording for these ancient environments. Um, so we're gonna take a, a, a bit of a field trip <laughs> today to, um, to what, what Minnesota's past oceans looked like. So to do that, um, we've got some, some tour guides. So these are some students who I've worked with um, in the past. So we're gonna take a look at some work that Sam Duncanson uh, has done over the last two years. Um, he recently graduated from the lab. And then uh, Danny uh, uh, was working with us as well as an undergraduate and Paul. Um, and here they are uh, working uh, and looking at the classic Sudan um, outcrop. Um, we stopped there on our way. Uh, we did a, a tour through um, when they all were first starting. So to get started, um, really this, this story of how ancient iron rich um, rocks tell the story of past oceans, it's actually a story recorded in minerals. So one of the main things that our lab does is we decipher these different order of events from the mineral histories in these different rock units. So we do that by looking at composition. So that's one thing we care about. So in this field of view, you've got some mineral phases and uh, this one, um, all these dark phases in the field of view are iron silicate minerals. So in this case, it's greenolite and iron, um, silicon, oxygen being the main components of that silicate mineral. We can also look at texture. So texture becomes very important of not just what mineral is there, but how, what are the relationships um, that they show texturally. So here we have some grains, so these dark grains here, and then the space filled between them is uh, filled by a different mineral phase here, the cement. So we can look at composition, texture, and mineral-mineral relationships. So here, not only is there a difference between the grains and the cement, which have different compositions, and we can see that one is filling space and one is a grain. There's also a relationship here where this cement has a nucleation point. These crystals are, are growing and radiating outward from this point. So you can see these little arrows here. These are sort of building these little fans um, radiating out from each of these grains. And also there's this little rim of a different mineral phase around each of these granules. So all these things together, they can help tell us about um, what not only the order of events of what's happened, but we can start to decipher this rock's history. We can also think about micro-mineral interactions. So this is a silicified stromatolite. So this is a, a, an ancient microbial mat that now is completely mineralized. Um, and this, uh, you can see these nice wispy layers here. That would be the, the, the dome of the ancient microbial mat. Um, but we have some familiar features. So this is a granule trapped in there, just like the granule from the last image. And then there's um, similar mineral phases. So in this particular sample, um, there's some hematite uh, that's moving around. Um, so we can see that this dark phase um, in this field of view is hematite. And then the, uh, the gray and white um, phases throughout our quartz. So we can think about you know, what, what role are our microbes playing? Are they changing anything about the local environment, which pre allows precipitation of a different phase? You know, are they just being preserved by the mineral? What's the, what's the relationship between microbes and minerals in these samples? So these are all things that, uh, that we investigate in our, our lab. Uh, the other thing uh, that we can do is at a sort of building out in scale, we can look at how these things vary between samples and between individual bands. So we can look at band-to-band -band mineral uh, variation. So in this uh, beautiful sample, this is a, a, a neo-archaean sample, 
so about 2.7 billion years old, um, but still has these beautiful microbands preserved. And you can see there's a variation in content between uh, magnetite and hematite and quartz in this case. And that can be different depending on the unit you're looking at. So there can be band to band variation, there can be sample to sample variation, and that's all telling you something about what happened to this unit um, and this, this rock throughout its history. We can also build that up into a larger scale. So uh, this again is the, the classic Sudan iron formation outcrop. Uh, but we can look at not only how things vary locally, but how, how across stratigraphic scales. So, so building out and connecting um, the units that are related across a region, we can look at mineral variation at that large scale as well. So we, uh, our, our lab works sort of from the field scale down to the micro scale to ask questions about past oceans. So our goal today, again, is to take a, a quick virtual field trip back to what Minnesota was like uh, about 1.9 billion years ago. So we're going to focus on the Proterozoic um, today. But our goal is to really walk through how we use minerals to decipher original geochemical signatures that are preserved in rocks that have experienced a very long, <laughs> this is a, that's a very long swath of time. Um, so they have a very long history and sometimes they get heated up quite a bit. And so things change. So we have to decipher that change in order to get back at what was originally there. So a brief outline for today, we're gonna introduce sort of this setting. What are, what's, a, what's our setting look like and why would we care about these rocks um, that represent such ancient um, vestiges of a past we no longer um, um, have. So we'll also think about how do we read the record of these past environments? So we have these old rocks, but how do we tease apart the last couple billion years of what's happened to them to get at what they were like when they were made? So how do we peel back the layers of time? And then we'll, from that, once we're back in time, we can think about what the ancient ocean was like. So we'll, we'll look at some, some postcards from the Proterozoic past. So what, what, what was the Proterozoic like? So uh, first, first point here, setting the stage for early Earth. Um, so often when I, when I talk about what early Earth looks like or what people have kind of a vision of it, it's, it's sort of this very inhospitable place, this um, you know, planet sterilizing impacts, this, this place that was not very um, conducive to, to life in terms of you know, when, when life um, could have started on the planet. So we have um, uh, this early Earth environment. There's a lot to still um, decipher about it. So putting that on sort of the time scale, um, so here we have uh, early uh, today on the right hand side and uh, early Earth on the left hand side. And so this early part of Earth's history, we have these potentially large asteroid impacts, we have the potential to vaporize the ocean. But even though we have this really, um, you know, this landscape that's not very habitable, we have I, land, uh, signatures of life that are quite old. So we have carbon isotope um, evidence for life at the early part of the Archean. And we also have evidence for oceans all the way back potentially in the Hadean. So in these earliest time frames, we still have evidence for life. So looking at that, that life actually preserves in iron rich rocks. So one of the, the things that we want to know about these iron rich rocks is they, they, they appear in a, across a large swath of time. So these early rocks, um, they, this one here is a, an example of, of putative microfossils that might be as old as 3.7 billion years old. And so these are, are considered hydrothermal precipitates and they're in iron formation. And so thinking about early life and uh, the preservation of early life in iron rich rocks, we can start to think about what that environment looked like. So they form a key, a key rock type that we can look at across this early part of Earth's history. Here's another example of really early um, examples of, of life uh, or potential, potential life. So here is a, a 3.7 uh, billion year old uh, microbial mat structure. Um, and so that's uh, also very early in the Archean. But an issue with these really old rocks, especially when you're this far back in the Archean, is that they're very, they have very complicated histories. That's 3.7 billion years of things that have happened after it formed. And oftentimes they have experienced a lot of heat, a lot of pressure. They've been nearly through the rock cycle, right? So this, uh, this, uh, these uh, two titles here are, there's uh, this, uh, this, uh, 
location has been argued over a lot <laughs> for some of these really early examples of, you know, what, what is a life like? What does a lifelike signature look like? And what is the environment that these rocks form in? The good news is once we get a little closer <laughs> toward modern in time, we do have examples of really great preservation. So and the 3.7 billion year old units um, here. So this is a picture of a classic unit um, from Australia the apex chert. And so we can, we can mount tiny fragments of these materials and we can look in them with high resolution uh, tools, geochemical tools, microscopy tools. Uh, we can look inside these rocks and uh, figure out what evidence is there for things like early life and environmental signals. The other thing that uh, across this time frame, the other thing that we care about is not only sort of thinking about can we can we figure out what has happening with this early record of life, but also what's happening in the environment. So uh, this is a, a, a classic diagram showing the, the rise in oxygen. So across this time uh, frame with the stars, this uh, this time frame down here is uh, uh, at the same uh, scale. So what, what we see across in the transition between the Archean to the Proterozoic, we see a rise in oxygen. And this again is recorded in iron rich rocks. Um, so we see this rise in oxygen, which after we start to build up oxygen, we start to change what the biosphere looks like. So we start to have the appearance of potential eukaryotic fossils. Uh, we see different, different organisms start to be preserved. And so in Minnesota, we actually preserve Archean and Proterozoic rocks. So it's kind of a great place to study these really early timeframes that have these absolutely fundamental changes these fundamental changes in the biosphere and these really interesting changes in the global environment, like the rise in oxygen is, is captured across this time frame. For us, the other exciting thing is that in Minnesota, um, there's outcrops of uh, the Gunflint and the Biwabic iron formations. Um, so those are our Proterozoic in age. And they were um, really spectacular. They were one of the first localities of the whole world um, where people found microfossils. So there was this problem initially of thinking, where are the microfossils? What, what about these deep time rocks? Why are they sort of devoid of fossils? So until we, um, someone found these localities, um, in this case, these um, fossils are uh, from the Gunflint Church. This uh, particular outcrop is in Canada. Um, but these are all different microfossils that are 1.9 billion years old. So thinking about life um, and thinking about what, what types of environment they might live in, iron formation becomes a really good rock type to tell us that type of information across a huge swath of time. So this box here that kind of sits over the time scale this is the, the whole time range of which we have a large scale iron deposits and they are forming in the ocean. So these are rocks that are precipitates. They are forming in the ocean and as a result have the potential to record things about that ocean. So across a really large swath of the Precambrian, we have these iron rich rocks that also preserve not only microfossils, but hints at what these early environments were like. So by studying these early earth environments, that can sort of help us figure out where, how, under what conditions these early life preserve, but also they're key to figuring out um, these, these rocks are very robust. So silica and iron rich rocks are very key to figuring out um, what types of geochemical information is preserved there. Because not all rocks preserve information about past environments, but these particular sedimentary rocks do a great job of that. So we also care about that if you all uh, watched the landing that happened in February. So um, the current mission to Mars, um, they, are, they found water previously. Previous missions have found water. And where there's water, there's typically life. And so the Perseverance rover that just landed um, in February is actually the first Mars mission to, to have the, the mission to search out past signs of microbial life if they ever existed on the planet. And so um, that's really exciting because for those of us that study early Earth, that's sort of like a key by which we can start to decipher different types of environments um, that might be, might be useful uh, tools to, to think about you know, what, what did this past look like. So what our lab focuses on is how do we read this record of past environments and past life? And the answer is through the minerals that are there. So we can peel back different layers of time with our toolkit um, using geochemical, 
<laughs> geochemical toolkits and textural tools. So um, thinking about how, how we do this, I have two, these will be um, GIFs here in just a second. So uh, on the left-hand side, we'll walk through what's happening um, geochemically. And then on the right-hand side, we'll look at textural features. So on the left, this is an example of one of those microbial mats. And you can see those nice layers. And what we can actually do, we have analytical tools where we can map out single crystal chemistry. So we can have a beam instrument where we actually measure for each of those spots that are there, what is the chemistry of that particular spot. So we can see variation up this very small column. So you can see the scale in the, in the picture is about one centimeter. So these are 15 micron beams. Um, so we can get single crystal information. And so that's really powerful thinking about a record of change. The other thing we can do moving to the right hand side, um, this you can see there's sort of a grain in the field of view, but there's lots of things about it. There's cracks, there's um, different phases there. So what we can do with textures is we can start to decipher an order of events. So here we've got a grain that appears, it was cracked, and then we have minerals that start to form uh, and they nucleate on those surfaces. And so we can start to decipher okay, this happened first, this happened second, this happened third. And if we pair that with the composition, so what it's made of, we can start to get a record of that change through time. So we can see the, the evolution of that rock through time. So uh, that's sort of what we, what we do in a nutshell. So we work, here's uh, um, some students in the field uh, collecting and mapping uh, up, a, we, up a section of, of iron formation um, and then uh, taking those samples uh, taking up and cutting them into small pieces, mounting them in specialized mounts, polishing to them to a very fine polish so that we can hit them with beams that are very, very small. So here's an example of, of the spot. It's only 10 to 15 microns, which is like half the width of a single hair. <laughs> so they're very, very small. It's pretty incredible, the, the analytical power um, that, different, uh, that, we, that different labs have. So, um, we can take the information at this very large scale and start to look at variation at the very small scale. So that's uh, cool, but what can, we what can we learn from that about um, ancient oceans? So we're gonna take a, a quick trip to the Proterozoic and sort of detangle some of these mineral relationships, looking at compositions, looking at textures and seeing if they can help us decipher um, the history of the Biwabic iron formation. So setting the stage, um, this was uh, this is about a 1.9 billion year old uh, unit. And again, it was this sort of classic locality um, in the, the late uh, 60s and 70s that uh, where they had discovered microfossils, um, which was really a significant discovery for the, the field of Precambrian geology because um, they hadn't uh, had microfossils um, discovered before that point. So here, uh, we're going to take a look at some of um, Sam's, Sam Duncanson's work. So if you want to read Sam's thesis, there's a link on, on various slides, um, and I can send it in the chat. Um, but Sam did a, a fantastic job sort of deciphering and looking at mineral relationships in the Boabic iron formation. So in, in total, we're going to look at um, two uh, sets of data from two different drill cores um, and many, many uh, samples from that. So looking at the Bawabic in thin sections, so this is a cross polarized light um, view. So we're looking at a thin slice of this material and we're seeing how light interacts with it. And so we can see there's a lot of visual information there, right? There's grains. Some of those grains have coatings. Sometimes there's stuff in between each coating. There's lots of stuff in between grains. And then there's a boundary between a layer that lacks grains compared to the layer that has a lot of grains. So within this uh, field of view, there's tons of textural information to decipher in addition to the fact that you have several different minerals present, right? So you've got um, lots of quartz, you've got some green phases, which oftentimes wind up being iron silicate minerals. You've got chert fragments. And you've even got ripped up uh, pieces of cement fragments in there. So there's a rich history to decipher, um, even within this very small field of view of 500 microns, of, of the scale bars 500 microns. So what we can do is we can take texture and composition and we can decipher the relative order of events at that micron scale. We can do that for each sample so that we can build a picture overall of what the directionality of change was in the whole section. So if we have a question like, 
can we possibly preserve information that's 1.9 billion years old? The answer is all you have to do is peel back what's happened to get to what was originally there. So once you, once you start to peel back the order of events, you can subtract out those things that happen post deposition after the rock formed, and you can get back to primary chemical information, which in the case of iron formation um, is linked to seawater composition and how it has evolved or changed through time. So for us, our lab has, has kind of shifted to focus on the role of silica because it has uh, it acts as a great preserver. So many iron rich rocks are famous for their iron contents, not only for how we use the iron, but also for their link to microbes. So lots of my microbes can uh, metabolize um, iron and there's lots of interesting interactions that go on with microbes and iron rich phases. For us, we're, we're really interested in what is the best preserved material and what can that tell us about past ocean chemistry. So what we've found um, over time is that a lot of times um, there are units that contain a lot of silica. And so these um, silica rich layers, they can be in layers, they can be in lenses or, or nodules. So you can see this is sort of a, a circular um, feature here. So this is a chert nodule. You can see some others here. And um, if you look at them in, in thin section, you can see in the, in the nodule, so in the center part, you have little grains. And then in the dark version, um, this, this uh, part here, it sort of lacks grains. And so there's a textural difference between the different um, bands versus the areas that have these grains or granules um, and where you're preserving lots of silica versus where you're not. And what we think is happening here is there is um, evidence to suggest that this silica addition to this sediment is happening at the sediment water interface. And with silica, it's very um, robust. It likes to stick around. And once you precipitate it, if you, if you fill the available space with that phase, um, it's hard to get rid of it. You can get rid of it, um, but it sticks around quite uh, for a long time. So if this process of adding silica or silicification occurs at this sediment water interface, what was originally the set that, that boundary, then can we preserve primary information ge that's geochemical in nature? Can we get at what the primary mineralogy of these iron rich materials were? And what does that tell us about things like pH, things like oxygen contents, um, these critical things for thinking about early life? So um, bringing, bringing back to center um, Sam's work. So Sam, um, again, recent uh, uh, master's um, student in my lab um, was working on, okay, taking these well-preserved silica cemented horizons, if we investigate mineral compositions in those horizons, what types of changes do we see? Do they preserve mineral compositions, um, a range of mineral compositions? Is there relative heterogeneity or homogeneity? Um, what can we learn about looking at these silica cemented horizons? And the first um, take home point that Sam uh, was pretty soon as soon as we started looking at these at these nodules was that there the grain shape is preserved within these nodules very well compared to banded horizons um, that are adjacent where you start to see compression of grains. So here each of these little um, circular or ovoid spots is, is a granule and you can see their shape is preserved here um, but in the banded horizons they started to appear uh, much more squished. And so thinking about preservation, it's possible that these cemented horizons preserve granule shapes. The other um, uh, thing that, that Sam investigated was using a tool where we could look at getting uh, individual compositional data from single mineral phases. So a mic an electron microprobe, um, if that's a familiar tool for, for some of you. So that uh, tool, with that tool, you can get single crystal mineral data, which is pretty, pretty incredible. And so um, in these silica cemented horizons, um, we were interested in, can we decipher the order of precipitation? Um, so thinking about what mineral came first, second, third, kind of like that GIF that was shown before. So here's one of these silica cemented horizons. This is a silica nodule. And uh, what uh, he found was that you can see um, a sort of classic cross-cutting relationship um, following, following sort of first, first principles of, of what came first, second, third. 
you can see that this phase, stilpnomalane in this case, which is an iron silicate, but that has lots of other cations in the front end of, of it. <laughs> um, it has it, this, this so stilpnomalane is cross-cutting other phases like minisodiite, which is another iron um, silicate mineral phase. And so with that, oh, go ahead. Was there a question? <laughs> oh, nope, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So uh, with that, so if we have these two relationships where we have one phase cutting across another phase and we can measure the composition of both, um, what Sam was able to determine is that there, is, there looks like to be a reaction between the two. So one thing we, we try to decipher at this small scale is what do we have there that's already reacting, uh, that's able to react and what does it make from that reaction? So what, what's there to start with and what does it become as the end product? And so thinking about this cross-cutting relationships, the stilpnomalane um, that he measured was cutting across the minisodiite. And so there, there um, was a, a reaction. People have, have postulated this in iron formation um, before. I'm thinking if you have this mineral phase, which has this, this formula where you've got silicon, oxygen, a little bit of uh, OH at the end, and magnesium and iron, as long as you have a few available cations um, and maybe some water, you can make stilpnomalane, which is this, um, this formula that has um, more things in the front part of it. So this is um, stilpnomalane. And uh, there's a, a relationship when we measured the, um, the individual points where there was a, a potential reaction um, going on between there shown by texture, but also this, this compositional relationship. And that was only found in the silica cemented horizons. So also within those silica cemented horizons, um, they preserve really iron rich minisodiate compositions. And so um, there's sort of a, a field, um, if we look at the amount of magnesium, iron plus manganese and aluminum, we can kind of establish these uh, mineral fields. And so um, the, the mineral field for, for minisodiate a lot of the Minnesotaite that was plotted near, that was measured near banded horizons, so at the at the boundary of the of the nodule, that Minnesotaite plotted in this vicinity, uh, which is more magnesium rich. So the way to read these is sort of if you're toward the left hand side, you're more magnesium rich. If you're toward the right hand side, you're more iron rich, and the Minnesotaite within the silica cemented horizons. Um, was more iron rich. And the reason that was interesting is because in those horizons, if there was greenolite present, there wasn't always greenolite present, but if there was this completely an iron silicate, so very little magnesium in this formula here, if there was this uh, greenolite present, the, the minisodiite always cross cut it. So this relationship between this earlier phase and the secondary phase. So here we have greenolite um, is this granule here. So this ovoid shape. And then you have these um, minisodiite um, the, um, features here. Um, so this, this phase was cutting across uh, or sometimes nucleating around this greenolite material. And so in terms of preservation, um, again, sort of circling back to this compositional relationship, um, this uh, relationship here in terms of Minnesota having an iron rich composition and in this field of view where we're looking at um, fine scale, scale detail of, of the textural relationship between those two minerals, we see that they are connected. And so that composition that we see that's more iron rich could link to this reaction where you had greenolite that is uh, reacting to become minisodiate during potentially this post deposition or post formational um, alteration that's happening. And that can be early in the history of the of the rock, or it can be a little bit later, sort of as the as the material starting to become a rock during diagenesis. So all in all, we can take these textures, these compositional data, and these mineral mineral relationships, and we can look at that. We just looked at sort of one sample um, and looked at the, the mineral the mineral relationships in that sample. You can do that across all the different units. So you can go and you can walk from the oldest part of the stratigraphy to the youngest part of the stratigraphy, and you can map out changes. And what that allows you to do is sort of build a picture of what's happening in this depositional system. So going back here for just a second, if I figure out 
a phase that was early and we can figure out that that's pretty consistent across a lot of the data sets um, up the, the entire stratigraphy of the unit, then we can figure out what are the conditions required to make that phase form, right? And, and maybe there's not just one solution, maybe there's multiple primary or uh, texturally early um, original mineral phases that were there. So um, putting things together, what that means is if we find out what's early, we can start to put constraints on things like pH or things like um, how much oxygen was present. So that phase, um, that iron silicate phase, if in some part of the stratigraphic section, um, we find that that's the primary phase, which in this particular example, well, in one part of the section, it was it was um, the most primary phase that we could find, but it wasn't true for all the sections. But in one section, we found that that greenolite uh, was present and was the most primary phase um, that was there. And uh, that mineral phase has to, it only occurs in conditions that lack oxygen. So anoxic conditions means there's not a lot of oxygen. But you have to have high iron contents, high silicon, silica contents, and a pH that ranges from about 7.7 .7 to 8.3. So that puts some sort of numbers on if, if that's something that's forming in the water column, those are sort of boundaries of what the water column chemistry might have looked like. So we can use these tools to kind of start to decipher and paint that picture. Okay, we have a system that lacks a lot of oxygen that has a sort of um, circumneutral pH. And that's really important for thinking about who can live there and whether or not we might preserve um, what something about that ecosystem. The other part of this figure, so that that um, a unit um, is the example kind of we walked through. We we did find other examples where a mineral like hematite was the most primary phase. And so the other important thing about putting these together in sort of the big scale, so taking it, moving it from the small scale outward to the big scale, is that you can see how things might change over time, or perhaps in different sections of your, of your stratigraphic unit that you're looking at, maybe you're looking at different water depths. So in the case of hematite versus greenolite as the first initial phase, you might be in some samples in shallower water, right? So you might be recording shallower water conditions. And so you might have something that, uh, that uh, a mineral phase that indicates that there is oxygen. So um, this uh, diagram here in this line is sort of separating a boundary that likely exists in the water column below which you have very low oxygen, above which you have oxygen. And so we have these different primary mineral phases. And the reason that's important is linking back to thinking about when oxygen initially rose and what that meant for uh, a significant change across the surface of the planet. So this reduced phase um, that we find in the Biwabic iron formation, at least in parts of it, um, that's important because a lot of the models that we use um, for iron formation after this initial rise in oxygen, um, we think of a lot of oxidized phases as being the primary phases. So the, the uh, point of still having reduced phases, at least in part of the water column, potentially deeper water, um, that's important to note if we're thinking about um, what the system looks like overall. So thinking about what we can do, if we start to use this picture that we have, so talking about stratigraphy, if we can pull back the, the relationships between different phases, we have a framework now so that we can say, okay, this was the order of events. After that point, we can then go back to the sample set and we can say, let's look at the best preserved samples and look at different geochemical features of those samples. So in this case, this uh, schematic diagram on the left here, this is sort of walking from the bottom of the stratigraphy to the top of the stratigraphy, in this case, in one drill core. So in the Bowabic, there are these different classic sections um, that are divided into churdy and slaty units. And so once we have an, a, a, a toolkit for saying, okay, here's where we're gonna preserve geochemical information, we can start to take and look at those, we can target those samples and, and look at things like, okay, what is the aluminum content? What is this rare earth element content? So this is a, a rare earth signature that people use for thinking about whether or not there's oxygen or not in this system. 
So for this diagram is just meant to, to sort of um, introduce the idea that after we sort of go through this work of figuring out where primary information preserves, we can start to think about what the geochemistry is of that environment and how it changes over time. So in this example, if we walk from the bottom to the top and we separate out the silica cemented horizons from the banded horizons, we can see different trends, right? So there's some, some bumps and squiggles that go back and forth for different parts. In the case of this, um, this is a cerium anomaly. Um, this is, is used to tell whether or not we're forming in oxic conditions or conditions lacking oxygen. So blue is oxygen, uh, red is no oxygen. So what we can look at is in these well-preserved sample sets in part of the section, we have material that looks like it forms under conditions where we have oxygen. And in other parts of the section, we have uh, indicators that we might be forming in an in a environment that lacks oxygen. So we can start to track change just within this single um, area, this single time point overall. Uh, there's, there's certainly time chains from the bottom to the top of the stratigraphy, but we can look at change within this local environment and think about the implications of that change. We can also do that when materials are not in place. So thinking about what happens if you have remobilized material, material that was once in one place and for some event you know, was, was transported. We can still map that out and look at those features. So we can still put together mineral textures, compositions, and those mineral mineral relationships to paint that big picture, even when something's not in place. So here is an example of a, a class, a part of a class, a field of view of a class. So this is a, a fragment that was likely transported and it was deposited into this other host material. But you can see at the contact, there's a really interesting reaction rim. So something about the chemistry of this fragment was different from something about the host material that it was redeposited into. So it was taken and moved, and it was moved into an environment that was different. And you can record that change by looking at and comparing the section from one, the host material, to this reaction rim, to the uh, class that was there. You can also use uh, microbial coatings can also tell you a lot about whether or not something has moved from its original position. So here we have a class uh, A and a class B and all these little um, layers. So layer, uh, layer one, layer two, layer three, those are coatings on those grains. So in this case, layer one is coating just class A. Layer two is coding just class A, but capturing some, some other material in here. But layer three is coding grains A, class A and B. And so what that tells us from an order of events standpoint is that you picked up and transported A and B independently, right? And then you coded A once, twice, but then at some point A and B were next to each other and then you have this microbial coating that drapes both of them. So then they were moved together as a class. So there's multiple cycles of deposition and redeposition. But with textures, we can start to backtrack out that order of events. So even when things have, have changed from their original position, we can still backtrack out information. So all in all, what story uh, is sort of the take home message here? Um, these minerals kind of uh, give this indication that these silica minerals that are forming these silica rich nodule layers where we have this intricate textural relationships preserved, they might be preserving, acting as preservation agents. And so they might be preserving um, information that's linked to early diagenesis. So something that's happening at the sediment water interface, nearly when the rock formed, which is really powerful for telling us about really early chemistry. And if that's true, then we can start to look at geochemical information that's specifically preserved in those targeted horizons to get at what information might actually link to past seawater rather than anything that happened during its, uh, its later history one, over the last 1.9 billion years. So with that, um, I want to make sure I have time for, for questions and things that you want to go back to and discuss. And, and uh, yeah, thank you. 
Wow, I can't believe that we're already almost at uh, six, we're past 645 already. That was fantastic. <laughs> it was so much information and I was soaking it all in. Yeah. yeah thank you. <laughs> um, we did have a couple of questions that popped up on the screen. And if, if you do have a question and you're having troubles unmuting yourself, if you just want to raise your hand, I can help you um, unmute. But um, Dan had a question about where would the stromatolites in Western Australia fit into this scale back when you were on the yeah. stromatolite one? Oof, let me just uh, escape and go back to it that way. Yeah, so they would fit in. That was, um, so here, these are fitting in right where the star is. So about 3.5 billion years ago. So these are those classic um, Western Australia stromatolites. They fit in with this apex chart. What's yeah, that? Didn't they find some that were even older at this recently? They found some that were even, you know, it was in some iron formations. Yeah, so, so this one has come up. So these are the putative stromatolites from the Isua Greenstone Belt in Greenland. So this was in, this made the news in 2016 and then again throughout 2018. <laughs> and uh, the, this discovery um, was, was stromatolites in Greenland that were 3.8 billion years old or older than 3.7. There's a lot of discussion about the age. But then another group um, and many groups have gone back and sort of there's this argument of preservation. It's very, very um, like there are several groups who, who think that you can preserve these features through pretty intense metamorphism. So temperatures up to 500 degrees Celsius <laughs> um, and deformation. And there are other groups that, that say you can't. Uh, so, so there's sort of this battle of preservation, but also in Greenland, the ice is melting. So the other interesting thing about Greenland is that as the, the ice sheet recedes, more of that belt is exposed. And so each year people find new features there because of this, this, this uh, new exposures that are found. So this particular example from Greenland, which is older, but highly contested, <laughs> um, is, is something that people, you know, every year is sort of, oh, what's newly gonna be freshly exposed um, under the ice? But you're right, there are, there are certainly older examples. I highlighted the, um, the, the Western Australia stromatolites because they're sort of um, one that's like, okay, once we get to 3.5, those are sort of generally broadly agreed upon to be um, remnants of ancient life. So, so what you're saying is, is that geologists, their vacation plans all point towards Greenland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, Earl had a question and he was asking, so is the silica the cement? Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, and so so oftentimes, so if, if you've if you've heard of the word cement in terms of like a sandstone reservoir, we think of that as something that is a, a feature that's late, filling the space between the grains sort of just before it becomes a rock. It's important for whether or not you have good reservoir quality. So there's lots of people that study sandstones for their cements um, because it links a lot to hydrocarbons. Um, in these rocks, the silica cement. A, it, there's a lot of textural data that would point to that cementation process happening really early. And the reason for that is at this time frame, we don't have organisms like we do today who are taking all the silica out of the water column. So today we have things like diatoms um, that are taking and making their hard parts out of silica. And we have sponges that do the same thing. But this far back in time, we don't have those uh, mechanisms to take silica out of the water column. So it's thought that we're at a point where it's so saturated that you might be doing this process of silica precipitation rather on widespread scales, um, but also rather rapidly in that you have a lot of silica to get rid of from the water column in that way. Interesting. I've, I've got a question. Um, I'm just curious what sort of temperatures, like ocean temperatures we're looking at when these are forming. Great question. That has been a heated discussion for a really long time. So, so um, one of the tools we use, so that sort of single crystal approach of like mapping out um, what the variation is from single crystal to crystal, we can do that with geochemical data, but also isotopic tools. And with isotopes, something like oxygen, it can track things like temperature. And so um, 
back this far in time, there's sort of a discussion of these oxygen isotope values point to it being a relatively warm ocean. So um, kind of everywhere being um, very much warmer than today, which would which would be um, interesting from a lot of different standpoints of, of life of what you know, what type of life would thrive in that environment. Um, but with these records, uh, this, the, the work that, the, that we kind of highlighted here is there's a lot of critique about how you peel back the layers of time. So do, do things like isotopes on these quartz crystals, are those robust markers of temperature? Or is that temperature that you're recording actually something that happened after the rock was buried? So the, the temperature range is pretty wide. So that kind of goes, goes back and forth. Um, it could be a warmer, ocean than today, um, but it could be very similar today. There's not a lot of evidence for it being super cold at this particular time frame for the, um, the Wabak iron formation, but there certainly are glacial events um, that do happen across um, this early part of Earth history. I wonder if Dr. Bill has any questions. Oh, there's Keith, sorry. Um, <laughs> Can you unmute or do you need help? Always need help. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to unmute. She get a little pop up. Dr. Bregman, I kept thinking about taking up one of those micrographs of, of a, a Lake Superior agate because I'm looking for that banding in there. Yeah. <laughs> and it's got silica. Yeah. It, have you ever seen one in thin section? I have not. I think I'm sure I have an example. Um, I don't know if I can find it, but I, if I, I'll email it to to uh, Ashley and I'll I'll show you. It's it's beautiful. So it's it's these beautiful layers. Um, it's an incredible uh, mineral relationship. So you can see, you know, how in agates you have sometimes the really fine bands, really small crystals, and the large crystals that are uh, you know growing at different rates. You can see all of that beautifully. <laughs> Would you let us uh, publish that in our in our newsletter? Oh, sure. The, the photo? Yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. Oh, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, That's no great. problem. <laughs> A great highlight. Okay, Keith, you're you're un, unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. A uh, quick question about ocean salinity and how does that play into all of this and can you date ocean salinity? Yeah. So, so in these single minerals, there are groups of people that look at what are called fluid inclusions in those mineral phases. So you can, you can trap gas and fluid actually as that mineral grows. And from that, people have looked at uh, things that you would expect to um, be in seawater. So things that would make it, um, you know, what is, the, what is the NaCl concentration in that little fluid inclusion. And so in these uh, particular samples, um, they do look like they contain, um, they are a saline environment. And so that's sort of one um, sure way to kind of figure out if you are um, in, in a saline environment or not. There are also, it brings up a, a, an interesting point of thinking about hypersaline environments. So there are, there are not all units across the world have been investigated for the salinity that, that those materials formed in. And one of the interesting points that people look at as analogs for some Martian environments is our hypersaline lakes. So, th so those occur in the modern. And uh, people are now starting to think about what, what is the deep time record of, of hypersaline um, lake regions across the world and um, looking at, at uh, what that means for the organisms that live there. Because a different set of organisms who like salt rich environments will live in those systems. So good question. <laughs> well, I, I do know that uh, in the Hamlin pool mm -hmm. uh, in Western Australia, it's uh, the salinity is much higher. Yep. And, and that's how the stromatolites survive. And in, uh, in Sabka environments too, you can get sort of stromatolytic features there. For, for these, um, you can also, you can have stromatolites in freshwater environments. And even, so there are stromatolites at the bottom of Antarctic lakes. Um, so there are groups that go to Antarctica and look at these lakes that are frozen all year round and they can find um, stromatolites living there. Um, which is so stromatolites are sort of these they can they can live and thrive in these very in these very very varied environments <laughs> if 
probably one of my favorite posts that um, Dr. Bill does is his stromatolites because I think they're so interesting. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say I probably can share. I have one sitting on my uh, desk right here. I can let me switch to switch this field of view real quick um, since you can see it. You all can see it. Uh, one light. There it is. OK, I think we, we love show and tell. <laughs> <laughs> did I um, did I switch to oop, I've switched to nothing. How about now? Right. Ooh, yeah. Okay. So in a second, I'll just focus it in a second. Um, okay. Can you, oh yeah, you can you can see you can see that. So this is this is the um, stromatolite from the the lower part of the bowabic. So you can see the nice uh, digits there. And I think we can. I think I can zoom in with this. So. Uh, so you can see, and here you have some veins too, so you can you can sort of track uh, what's happened in that sample. And here's a here's a different one. So that's a nice little domal stromatolite. So these digitate features. So this is also from the from the um, this one's from the the Mary Ellen, um, the famous locality. <laughs> and uh, this one again is from this one is. Uh, Part of the lower unit as well, but not from Mary Ellen. But this is a, a cut face. You can see. You can probably put a little water on that and see it a little better. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, the light's shining, but you can kind of get a <laughs> sense of the layering in there. <laughs> Doctor Bill, did you go pick a stromatolite up? <laughs> uh, well, I it's, she, she's got a nice one that's very much like what I have. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> So what what was the date for the for the Bowabic pre uh, precipitation when it precipitated out? What when did that start, and how many how long did it go on for? Yeah, it's another good question. So we have the it ended with the Sudbury impact. So the Sudbury impact layer at, at one thousand eight hundred fifty million years ago is at the top of the section. The bottom date is a lot less constrained. So we know that it's less than about two point one. Um, billion years uh, old, but but in terms of dates, there's a lot of of uh, dating that could be done to kind of if we if we if we found datable materials, um, that would be super helpful to to figure out. So there's a pretty large swath of time. So I kind of broadly said 1.9 bill, uh, billion just to kind of give it a general time frame, but it's certainly multiple millions of years, potentially um, you know over tens of millions of years represented in that strat column. Um, which is a lot of time. I think in the in the Precambrian, we bin things right in these really big bins. But like, think about what that would be in like our local environment. That would be a really large swath of time. <laughs> I have a question. What what was the impact of the mountain building time frames, and how did that funnel it all in the one spot? Yeah, yeah. So, so the Pinocchian orogeny happens after the deposition of the iron formation. So that sort of starts at the at the tail end um, of deposition in the on the Wisconsin Michigan side of things. So there's um, there's iron formation that are kind of broadly coeval across the region, right? And so in different units, I have a colleague who's who's been working on the Gagobic um, iron range, sort of teasing out some of those questions about dates, but also sort of did, did you still have sediment being deposited as you started this collisional mountain building event across the region? And so the rocks that we that I was showing today, they're all from the part of the range that is still flat lying. So they're, they're really, um, in terms of preservation, they're not deeply folded like you see or faulted like you see um, in terms of the, the units that are preserved in Michigan and upper Wisconsin. Um, so the, the deformation event that happened during that mountain building, that's recorded really well um, across northern Wisconsin um, and into Michigan. Um, here, we can certainly, um, there's certainly you know, a, a handful of features, um, but, but it's in terms of com comparative preservation, um, we can still, we can peel back things that are very late. So I didn't talk about magnetite, which is sort of the star of iron formation. Um, 
And that's mostly because all the magnetite that we've been finding in the samples is really large, really euhedral grains, um, crystals, and they cross cut every other phase. So they, there might be that phase early on, but we don't have a record of it. What we have is a record of that as being something later. So even if there are sort of post formational events like the Pinocchian driving fluid through the, the unit, we can, we can sort of look at how that affected those, those mineral phases. Does anyone else have any questions before we wrap it up? No? How hard are the, uh, the stones that she's showing? Ah, like uh, on the hardest scale, they're, they're mostly quartz. So they're, they would probably rank as a seven, but I cutting them, they're very hard. So <laughs> when I've had to cut them uh, over many hours to get to get uh, different different samples to different sizes, um, because you like you have silica as a starting phase, and then you fill every available space in that rock with silica, they can take quite a while to cut. Um, but you, you you can certainly cut them with with all the just like you would a, an agate or anything else. But um, for some of the large samples that I was showing, uh, like the one I just showed, the stratolite, that took quite a while to make the nice uh, face cut there with a with a wet tile saw. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you very